the materials inside the door for you. Do like I a little presentation first, myself. and then get started. For those of you the most informative programs that we plan for this month, uh, that's a uh, really give you an under look out. Maybe you'll have an opportunity to see if you have the right materials. We prefer you as a guidance counselor and as a parent of the college. It's like, oh, great job! And there goes my vacation. Here's a talk to you about. Uh, hey, everybody. This or the state grant for the state of Pennsylvania. FAFSA completions, financial aid nights, we do student presentations as well. So we'll go ahead and get started. Nice. Of, the, of what a student will have to decide where to go to school, or it could be a very small portion of the deci decision factor. So you can see lots of different factors go into where a student will attend school. How much does it cost to go to school? The four-year public institutions are between twenty and thirty thousand dollars for tuition fees, room and board for one year. Private institutions can go all the way up over sixty thousand dollars for tuition fees, room and board for one year. Um, if you had a kindergartner, you could anticipate the costs are probably going to double by the time that student gets to college, because tuition and fees typically go up three, four, five percent per year. So, you know that's the trend that we've been watching for the last thirty years, and and we do anticipate without any kind of legislative intervention that it will continue. So the moral of this story is students really want to get a lot of more a lot more money. Um, so you just want to make sure they get in, and they have to pay for two years. It's a four-year. You do have to think about the totals and the plus loan that they qualified for. They can't get it anymore because their credit a cheaper school first and get those those gen ed credits out of the way and then transfer to the school that the student really wanted to get their degree at so um, if that's going to be a factor if you're not going to be able to afford all four years maybe community college maybe a local institution first and then transfer less than 50 percent of students that start at a four-year program complete within four years schools advertise their six-year graduation rates when did that four-year degree become a six-year degree I read an article the other day that they're going to actually probably stop calling it a four-year degree because about, um, you know, most of the students, it takes five and a half years for them to complete that. So most students don't realize a bachelor's degree is 120 credits. If you take 12 credits a semester, which is considered full-time, it's perfectly acceptable at college, but if you take 12 credits times eight semesters, you only have 96 credits at the end of four years. So you're already behind. If anything happened, you had to drop a class, there was some kind of medical problem and you had to leave for a semester, you get further and further behind. And that's how students end up taking five, six, seven years to complete a bachelor's degree. They don't set themselves up for success ahead of time. You can see most students here, they take, um, only about 30% take enough credits to graduate. You know, what can your family afford? So you need to look at that. Return on investment. So is, is there gonna be a job for your student when they get out of school in the particular field that they're majoring in? We have a lot of very educated waiters and waitresses in this country because they get their degree and they can't find a job. So they have to find something um, to make those loan payments and they end up waiting tables. That being said, a higher education is still the best investment that a student can make in them. for students to, to make in themselves, but they really need to do it in a smart way and get in and get out as quickly as possible. I always ask students, you know, what do you want the rest of your life to look like? What do you want to have? Do you want to have a house? Do you want to have a car? Do you want to be able to go out with your friends? Do you want to live in your parents' basement for a while? And um, I usually have one student that says yes, that they do, but most students don't want to live with you for the rest of their life. But if they borrow eighty or $90,000 for that undergraduate degree, there's a good chance they're gonna be spending some time there. So, you know, how much are they gonna to have to borrow? What do those monthly payments look like? Are there jobs? And then again, if, if my family's struggling, maybe a cheaper option makes sense first. 
Um, maybe even if they're not struggling, maybe a cheaper option makes sense so I don't have to borrow as much money in the, lo in the long run. A couple of websites for you, um, and we will make these slides available as well so you don't have to furiously write down notes tonight, but the educationplanner.org and mysmartborrowing.org are FIA websites. Education Planner, maybe for younger students or students who really don't know what they want to do yet. Um, career searches, college searches out there. My Smart Borrowing, you can take a list of schools and compare them. So if students already know maybe five schools that they want to attend, um, you can pull up those schools. How much does it cost? How much might I have to borrow? And then you can compare different scenarios. So if I'm going to go to this school, I might have to borrow 30000 But if I go to this school, I might have to borrow 50000 So I can compare those and take a look at what that's going to look like in repayment. Collegecost.ed.gov is a federal website. It has a lot of good information in one place for you. So uh, the, the net price calculators are out there. Every school has a net price calculator which calculates what the average student pays to go to that school. You can go to the individual websites, but sometimes they're difficult to find. So if you go out here, you can take that list of schools and pull them all up at, this, you know, at one time from one place. The college scorecards are also out there, so um, it tells what the average indebtedness of their students are, the job placement rates at those, at those schools or from those schools. So a lot of good information at that website. I would definitely encourage you to take a look at that. Scholarship opportunities. Um, I'm guessing this is a scholarship. Okay, so again, the local scholarships, those are the ones students are most likely to earn. I would definitely encourage students, especially if it's a Baldwin High School specific scholarship, definitely have your student apply for that. All those local Kiwanis and Rotary and all of those types of scholarship. Um, check with your employer, your bank, your credit union, your church. Please don't, don't unheard. There are a lot of database searches that you can also search. Um, those are national database searches. So students are less likely to earn those, but you know, they might want to spend some time and take a look at those. Pittsburghfoundation.org is Allegheny County specific scholarships. So you have to weed through those a little bit, but you can pull up all the engineering scholarships, for example, and then you can go through them that way. Um, some of them are very obscure. You know, you have to be um, last name Smith and going to a school with the letter A in it and be left-handed. Um, you know, so you might have to look at them a little bit, but if the student, you know, you read the criteria, if the student qualifies, make sure that they apply for those. You might have students that don't want to write a, a lot of essays. They, they're creative. They want to do some projects. If you go and Google unusual scholarships, that's where you can find those duct tape to prom or who can make the best just peanut butter sandwich. Um, there's a left-handed scholarship for students. I think finade.org is where you can find the application for that one. Um, so there are different <coughs> scholarship opportunities for students, and they really should just spend some time and apply for those. That's a really good return on your time investment. Uh, most people don't make $500 for eight hours of their time. So um, really encourage them to spend some time and get all the free money that they possibly can. Average high school senior applies for zero scholarships. So if your student applies for just a couple, they're already going to be ahead of their peers. Free application for federal student aid. So the FAFSA application is your ticket into the financial aid process. It used to be that you had to wait until January 1st of your senior year in high school to complete the FAFSA application. This year, for the first year, they made the application available October 1st for seniors. So for 17-18, your application opened up October 1st, a couple of weeks ago. Anybody completed already? Is it bad? Good. So it's not that bad. Um, you have all your information, you sit down, you complete it. Usually it takes about you know half hour, 45 minutes in most cases. Um, but you can complete your FAFSA. So we will do that tonight if you'd like to stay. Um, or you can go home and, and attempt it on your own if you'd like to do that. And I'll give you some resources if you run into trouble later on at home that you could contact as well. But the application is available. This is the website. So it's FAFSA.gov. Make sure you go to FAFSA.gov. There are other websites where you can complete a FAFSA application and they will charge you $80 to do that. Uh, this is a free process. You do 
not have to pay for this process, so make sure you go to this website. If you're ever anywhere and they ask you for a credit card, just delete out of there and go to this website. It is the student's application and you are, um, you, there are parent portions to it. So when you're helping your student fill it out, if it's a student section, you make sure you answer the student questions. If it's a parent section, then you put your parent data in there. For the 17-18 academic year, you are using 2015 tax information and income information. You cannot change the tax base. So I have parents say to me, I left a job in 16, so I'm just gonna wait until January 1st to complete my FAFSA, and I'll use 2016 information. You cannot do that. You have to use, you have to report 2015 tax information on the FAFSA, but if anything changes, or has changed or will change before your student gets to school next year, you can contact the institution that they'll be attending, and you can also contact FIA and ask for a reduced income or a special consideration, and they can take into account what your current circumstances are, but you can't actually make those changes yourself, so just keep that in mind. The way that you sign this application is the FSA ID username and password. One student, or the student needs an FSA ID and one parent will need an FSA ID. If you have more than one student in college at the same time, parents use the same FSA ID for all of your students, but each individual student needs their own FSA ID. I would recommend when you go through this process, you write everything down, because you will need this FSA ID for other things, like signing for loans, next year when the student applies for financial aid. So you wanna make sure you write everything down and you keep it in a safe place. You do have to make sure you have separate emails for the student and the parent, and then the email that you use on the FSA ID is the email that you use on the FAFSA. It has to match for you to be able to use this to sign the application. Sometimes mom would fill out the FAFSA and she'd put her email address for the student and for the, for the parent. You can't do that anymore. Now, if mom has two email addresses and she would like to be in control that way, that's okay, but um, you really, need to have two separate email addresses. If you're not gonna be with us tonight to complete the FAFSA, I actually recommend that you do the FSA IDs in one sitting, and then you do your FAFSA in a, sec a separate sitting, uh, because this process can be a little frustrating, so hopefully if you are planning to stay, you already have your FSA IDs, so we won't be as frustrated as we go through the process tonight. The information that goes on the FAFSA is the household information. If parents are divorced or separated, it's the parent who provides more than 50% of the student's support. That's the household that you use. If that parent's remarried, step-parent information is required. However, aunts, uncles, grandparents, foster parents, anybody else that the student's living with, those people will never list their information on the FAFSA. That student's probably independent for some other reason. These are the independency requirements. Unless the students meet one of these criteria, they are a dependent student and you do have to list your parent data on the application. It does not re require that you pay anything for your student's education, but in order for your student to be considered for financial aid, you do have to list the parent data on the form. So unless the student's 24, working on a master's degree, a veteran, orphan ward of the court, in legal guardianship, being homeless, or has dependents other than a spouse, anything else, you do have to list your parent data. Deadlines probably aren't gonna mean as much this year, and the reason is most schools did not adjust their deadlines. So if they had a February 15th deadline for financial aid, it's still February 15th. If they had a March 1st deadline, it's still March 1st. What this process is supposed to do is it's supposed to align the admissions and the financial aid process a little more closely. Some schools, particularly private schools, will probably start packaging sometime in November. State schools, I talked to Pitt, they're not gonna do anything until probably second week of, of February at the earliest. So, but, but the point is, if you get your application in sometime this month, early next month, then once the schools do start to package students, you're gonna be in that pool of students that get packaged as long as the student's been accepted at that school. So, before Christmas, hopefully, maybe if your student applied to five schools, maybe you'll have three award letters, and then shortly after the new year, you have the additional two letters that you could then take until May 1st to make your decision on how the student's gonna pay. Because the deadlines are still in the new part of the year, 
that doesn't mean you should wait to file your FAFSA. Schools have institutional money, and they could run out of that money. So, um, you know, if your student qualifies for the institutional money, but you've applied in February and they've run out of that money, you know, because they started packaging so early, it's like you don't want you don't want to be in that situation. So, I would just get it in, even if students aren't sure where they're going to go to school. You can list up to ten schools on the FAFSA. So anywhere that a student's thinking of applying, they have applied, they've been accepted, I would add those schools. Later, if some, another school crops up on their radar, you can go back in and add additional schools, you know, take schools off there, whatever you want to do. But I wouldn't let that hold you up as to why you're not filing the FAFSA. State grant deadlines, still May 1st. So again, you're going to meet that deadline. When you click submit on your FAFSA, you're gonna get a number, and the number is called the expected family contribution. It used to be that that was what you could reasonably be expected to pay out of pocket for your student's education. It's not the case anymore, and the reason is the cost of attendance goes from like $7,500 a year all the way up to $75,000 a year. So if you have a zero EFC, student goes to community college, you're not gonna have to pay anything out of pocket. Probably won't even have to borrow a loan. Zero EFC at a school that costs $75,000 a year, you are probably going to have to pay something out of pocket. There is, in most cases, not enough free money for that student to go for absolutely free. The EFC has really become the Pell indicator. So if your EFC is about $5,200 or less, you qualify for a Pell grant. If it's more than that, you don't qualify for a Pell. This is generally how it's calculated. So there's a formula, you complete your FAFSA, they spin it through this formula. There's a student contribution and there's a parent contribution. Most of it comes from the income that you list on the form. <coughs> there are asset questions. They do not want to know about the value of the home that you live in, your retirement accounts, your life insurance, or your personal property. They want to know about things like if you have investment accounts, mutual funds, 529 plans, bonds, rental properties. Those are the kinds of things that they want to know about. There is an asset protection allowance based on the age of the older parent. The closer you are to retirement, the more of your assets actually get protected in the formula. Parent asset burden usually comes out to be about 6%. Student asset burden is 20%. So whatever they have in cash savings and checking, 20% of that goes toward the student number. Students can work. They can earn 6420. It will not affect their financial aid. Anything over 6420, they'll take half of it toward that student number. So if made $7,420, $500 just for that student contribution. And then parents who have more than one student in college at the same time, parent contribution gets cut in half. They're going to add that student number to the parent number, and that equals your EFC. There is a state grant form. It is for the first year only. So first time filers, one time, you have to remember to complete a state grant application. You are going to complete a FAFSA every year that the is in post-secondary school, but you only need to remember to do the state grant once. It's tied to your FAFSA, so you hit submit, you get this confirmation page. Up at the top, it says start your state application. You're gonna click on that, it's gonna take you to FIA. There's about seven or eight additional questions. You submit it online, but you have to print the PDF. There's a signature page. You print that off, you sign it, you mail it to Harrisburg. You do not have an electronic signature process for this state. So if you miss this link, the next time you go into your FAFSA, it's not there. You have to go out to FIA.org, create an account access for the student, and then when the student pulls up their dashboard page, that link will be available to them to complete the state grant form. If you still forget to do it, the student will get an email, hey, we got your FAFSA application, but we didn't get your state grant form, here's the link again. So you get a couple of opportunities to complete it, but just keep in mind that you do have to remember to complete that state grant application the first year. Questions about the process. So you've listed your schools on the financial aid application. Like I said, you can list up to 10 schools. Once the students are accepted at those schools, the schools are gonna package students. So they're gonna build a budget for the student. They're gonna look at direct charges, tuition fees, room and board. They're gonna look at indirect costs. So technology, transportation, books, whatever it costs to go to that school, 
They're going to build that budget, subtract the EFC, that's going to equal the student's financial need. Based on financial need, they're going to package the student. So with an EFC of $3,000, this student qualifies for a Pell Grant, so they're going to put a Pell Grant in their system. They qualify for a state grant, so they're going to put a state grant in there. Um, maybe there's some merit money, some scholarships, the loans. They're going to put all of that together and, and create that financial aid package, send a financial aid award letter to the student. Sometimes by paper the first year, sometimes by email. So I would say students are probably need to make sure they start checking mail and email sometime in mid-November. All of the award letters look different. What you're really trying to do is figure out how much of the money is free money that you don't have to repay, grants and scholarships, how much of it is self-help financial aid, meaning the work study that the student's gonna have to earn or loans that they'll have to repay, and then what is it actually costing the student to go to that school? This is a good example of an award letter because it's all on one page. It tells you right up at the top, this is free, you have to repay this, here's your tuition and fees, your room and board, minus the total aid, this is what you owe the school. So it's all there, they don't all look like this. But that's what you're trying to figure out. There's a, a one pager up here that helps you kind of compare award letters. So you wanna make sure you compare apples to apples, state schools to state schools, private schools to private schools, and then you have until May 1st to decide where the student Money comes from different pots. So when you eliminate a certain pot or you don't qualify for a certain pot of money, then you have to make it up somewhere else. So family resources would be the first pot of money. What have you saved? What has grandma saved? 529 plans, you know, how much can you pay out of your pocket? That's a family resource. Money from the colleges themselves, so that merit money that, that schools will give students, mostly private institutions. State schools typically don't have as much um, institutional money, so there might be some, some scholarship dollars, but they might be smaller. Um, private scholarships or grants, so those outside scholarships that students apply for. Federal or state financial aid, when you complete your FAFSA, you will be considered for the federal and the state financial aid. So you don't have to do anything extra for that. And then if you don't get the money from one of those, those pots of money over here, then you, have to, you might have to borrow it um, with the education. These are examples of gift aid, so things that students don't have to repay. Uh, first one is Pell Grant, Pell is a grant, you don't have to repay that if you qualify for it. The maximum this year is 5815. It will be increased for 1718 to 5920, so it actually is going up a little bit for next year, so that's good news for students. SEOG is Supplemental Educational Opportunity Grant. It is a grant, so students don't have to pay that back. Schools have very limited funding in this. So the government gives the school this small pot of money and then the school determines how they parcel this out to students. Students can get up to $4,000 in this, but most schools do not award $4,000. Maybe $500 or $1,000 because they wanna give it to the neediest students and they wanna spread it out as much as they can. This is one of the reasons you wanna be early in the process so that when that school starts to package, if your student qualifies for this, they would have money to award. There's a TEACH grant if your student wants to be a teacher. Check with the institution to see if they participate. Not all schools participate in this program. If they do, there's an agreement to serve. Student has to meet a teaching requirement. If they don't meet the teaching requirement, it does revert to an unsubsidized loan. Iraq and Afghanistan Service Grant is an award for a student who's lost a parent in the war on terror. The AmeriCorps program is a community service program. Students complete a community service assignment, usually in the summertime. The money that they earn gets paid toward their tuition in the fall. And then GI Bill, sometimes parents have GI Bill benefits, post 9-11 GI Bill or dependent uh, benefits that they can transfer to a student. Pennsylvania State Grant, uh, this year the maximum is 4348. Um, it's been level funded for several years. I wouldn't, I wouldn't anticipate an increase for next year. I would think it would be level funded as well. If students go out of state to school, your financial aid process is exactly the same. A FAFSA, you complete the state grant form. If students go to school in one of the states that are listed, you could take a very small state grant with you. Some schools will make that up to you. So I have a nephew that goes to school in Ohio, for example. He takes $500 from PA, they give him an additional $2,000 worth of state grant is missing. EAP is an award for National Guard students. KP is an award for student in the Department of Public Welfare System. There is a blinder that's beneficiary grant. Post secondary educational gratuity program is an award for a student who has lost a parent in the line of duty, such as firefighters and police officers. TAP is a 
the National Fund Scholarship Program. So if you go out to FIA.org, there's a list of scholarships that participate. If a student earns one of those scholarships, they can also be nominated for up to $2,500 in the PATH program. PA TIP is a program for students going into fields like energy or manufacturing. Usually those programs are less than two years in length, so they don't qualify for a state grant, but the PA TIP program could fill in where that state grant was missing. So we have HVAC students, for example, that can take advantage of that. If your student's looking at a business trade and technical school, check to see if the student participates. You can go out to PIA.org, and then if they do participate, check to see what the majors are that qualify. And then the Ready to Succeed Scholarship this is a scholarship that's for current college students, but I bring it up to you because it is an example of another scholarship that is awarded on a first come first serve basis. It's awarded, you have to qualify for it, so you have to have at least 24 credits, a 3.25 GPA at college, mm -hmm. um, and you have to be middle income, so maybe you didn't qualify for a state grant, but you could qualify for this Ready to Succeed scholarship. It's a $5 million pool of money at the state. So what they do is they compile the list of candidates, and they literally go by the date that you filed your FAFSA to award the money. So last year, you could start January 1st. We ran out of money about the second week of March, just to give you an idea. Again, you wanna be early in the process for some of these little wonky kind of programs that might crop up from time to time. Self-help financial aid, so work study, the student has to earn that. You might see it on the award letter, but it does not come off the bill. There's a question on the FAFSA, would you like to be considered for federal work study? I tell everyone to say yes, because it's easier to get it, to reject it than it is to get it back later. Student gets a job on campus, usually eight to 15 hours a week, minimum wage, a little bit more than that, and they get a bi-weekly paycheck. So they can use it for books or pizza, it doesn't matter, it's their money. And then the federal loan programs, we're gonna spend some time here, um, the direct staffer loan program plus plus loans for parents, and then the private and alternative education loans, we're gonna mention those as well. The average student for the class of 2016 borrowed about $37,000 <coughs> for college. So some of them borrowed less than that, and some of them borrowed more than that. This is what $37,000 might look like, so if there's $10,000 in each little stack here, this is what a million dollars looks like, this is what a trillion dollars looks like. Here's a little fellow over here. Um, student loan debt in this country has gone over a trillion dollars. It's outpaced credit card debt, it is very expensive to go to school, and a lot of families end up borrowing a lot of money. Sometimes students borrow more than they need, so that's something that you really want to consider. You know, if a student has to borrow, that's okay, but they really want to make sure they only borrow what they need. This is a repayment example. If a student borrowed the average that a, the student of 2016 had borrowed, at 37,000, it's about $375 in repayment for 10 years. Now this is a standard repayment, so this would be the cheapest repayment. Um, there are other repayment options. You can consolidate loans, extend them for 25 or 30 years. Um, there are income-based repayments and things like that, but this is just standard repayment. You pay back $8,000 over the course of that loan, those 10 years, and you have to make about $45,000 for this payment to be comfortable for that student coming out of college. So what if they decide, you know, I'm not gonna borrow everything that the average student borrows. Maybe I only borrow half of that. Your payment gets cut in half, you, you pay back half of the interest, and you only have to make half the salary. So now, when they come out, if they do make $45,000, they can start doubling up on these payments and get that loan out of there. So they don't have to take it into their 30s, 40s, and 50s. Studentloans.gov is the student loan website. There's a lot of really good information out here, so definitely take a look at that. You are not required to borrow any loans for the student to go to college. They will tell you on the financial aid award letter you qualify for this amount of money. You can borrow all of it, you can borrow a portion of it, so if you only need $2,000, you can tell them, just process $2,000 for me, or you can borrow none of it, it's up to you. If a student does choose to borrow any amount, they do have to go after the studentloans.gov, they're gonna sign in over here with that FSA ID, username and password, and they complete a master promissory note and entrance counseling. So the master promissory note is gonna be about 20 pages of fine print, that it's a loan, that they have to pay it back, and this is what happens if they don't, and nobody reads that, so they have to complete entrance counseling. You read a little paragraph, you answer some loans, uh, or some questions, that it's a loan, that you have to pay it back, and this is what happens if you don't. Two types of staffer loans. 
There's a subsidized portion and there's an unsubsidized portion. The subsidized portion does not accrue interest while the student's in school. They do get a six month interest free grace period before they go into repayment. The current interest rate on this loan is 3.76%. It is adjusted every year on July 1st and it's capped at eight and a quarter percent. So it would never go higher than that. The government takes an origination fee from the loan. So when you borrow $5,500, $5,441 actually gets applied to the bill. When you get your invoices in the summertime, loan amount doesn't quite look right. It's because the government took that fee. Unsubsidized loan does accrue interest while the student's in school. You are not required to make any payments on any of these loans while students in class. However, if you can afford to make quarterly interest payments, you're going to want to do that. And the reason is all of the interest that accumulates while they're in school it's added together at repayment, it's added to the principal, they start paying interest on top of interest. It's called capitalization. So to avoid that, you would make the payment. This is what that might look like. So let's just say that the student borrowed $2,000 at a 3.76 interest rate. You take 0.0376 times 2,000 divided by 365 days. This loan will accumulate 21 cents per day while the student's sitting in school of interest. You multiply it times 90, it's about 20 bucks a quarter. It's about 80 bucks a year, it's not too bad. What if they borrowed $10,000? Now you're up to $1.03 a day, now you're at 100 bucks a quarter, now you're at $400 a year. So you can see how the loan can grow as they're in school. So any amount that you can pay on this is gonna benefit the student. These are some of the loan servicing companies. Once the loan gets booked at the institution, one of the companies will contact the student, usually by email, or it'd be your like, loan servicer. You would contact them back, I want to make quarterly interest payments. Usually what they ask you to do is just set up an online account. You can go in there and make, make a payment periodically if you want to do that. These are the loan limits. So a freshman student can borrow $5,500, $3,500 of which could be subsidized if you qualify for the subsidy. So that was that need calculation I showed you at the beginning. My example had the $30,000 minus the three equals the 27. What they'll do is they'll subtract all of the other grants and scholarships and then if you still have $3,500 left at the bottom, you would qualify for the subsidy. If you don't, it could either be a different split or it could be all unsubsidized money. Sophomores can borrow a thousand more, juniors and seniors can borrow another thousand. There is additional unsubsidized eligibility for a student whose parent is denied for a plus loan. So we're gonna talk about plus loans in a second, but a, a plus loan is a credit-based loan, the parent applies and they get denied for that, the student can automatically borrow an additional $4,000 in the unsub program. So instead of $5,500 that first year, they can borrow $9,500 that first year. Parent loan for undergraduate students. This is an opportunity for a parent to borrow a federal loan for your student if you choose to do so. You still owe a balance at the school, how are you gonna make that payment? It's not a very attractive rate and fee, so I always tell parents, if you are gonna borrow for your student, you might wanna take a, a look at a home equity line of credit or something like that, because I'm sure you can do much better on that rate and fee. We do have parents that apply for this loan in hopes to get denied, so that their student can then get that additional 4,000 in the unsub loan. If you apply for this loan, and you get approved for this loan, but you really didn't wanna borrow this loan, you just don't sign the promissory note. So you don't have to go any further with it if that was the only reason that you're applying for it. Studentloans.gov is where parents will apply for this loan. You would go ahead and sign in with your FSA ID, username, and password, and then you could apply for it on that website. And then I do want to mention alternative and private education loans. These are loans of last resort. You still owe a balance at the school. How are you going to pay the balance? If a student goes into a financial aid office, the financial aid officer will probably say, here's a list of all the lenders we've ever done business with. Pick one. The rates, the terms, the fees of these loans all vary. Usually it's the student's loan, but they need a creditworthy co-signer. And if they're already borrowing the Stafford money, are they gonna be able to make these payments as well? So it's there if you need it, but you wanna make sure you read everything and borrow with caution. Questions about the types of questions? Affordability, 
state, um, community college maybe, but anywhere you want to go to college because you don't know what the money's going to look like. Sometimes private schools have a lot of institutional money. It might be cheaper to go to a private school than it is to a state school. So apply everywhere, but sometimes it might not be your first choice. So keep an open mind during this process. You're buying an education, not necessarily a school. We all know that you can get from point A to point B in a lot of different kind of ways, but maybe students don't think of it that way. So really encourage them to look at a lot of different options for the degree that they want. You know, you can get a lot of different degrees at price point. Um, yesterday's money, today's money, and tomorrow's money, yesterday's money, how much have you saved? How much did you write a check for, for your student's education right this second? Today's money, do I have expendable income every month? Schools have payment plans. So usually for $25 or $50, you can sign up for a 10-month payment plan. They add what you owe for the fall and for the spring together. And then you can decide, you know, I have $300 a month, I'd like to make $300 payments for 10 months, and that's $3,000 that we don't have to borrow. So if you owe $10,000 to the school for the year, you can say, you know, I'm gonna take a payment plan for $3,000 and I'm gonna borrow the $7,000. So you don't have to borrow as much if you wanna use some of your current income to do that. Tomorrow's money, how much are you willing to let your student get into debt, and how much are you willing to get to debt for your student? And if you have a lot of, or multiple students, you, you might have to, rules or, or make some considerations for that. Have your discussions up front, you know, set your parameters, you can apply everywhere, but this is where we need to be. Other ways to pay, so we talked about all of these. Double check with the school to see if there's anything else that they can do for you. Sometimes, particularly private schools, they might negotiate with you a little bit. So this school's gonna give you 15,000, this one's only gonna give you eight, but you really wanna go to this school. You know, hey, they're gonna give me a lot more money, I really wanna come to your school, is there anything else that you some schools will tell you, we gave you our best package up front, um, we're not gonna adjust it, but other schools may make some considerations. So ask the question, the worst that they can say is no. Um, state schools, they don't have any money, so um, you can ask the question, but most of the time they're probably gonna tell you that they can't help you with that. Other ways that you can save, students can commute, no student wants to commute, sometimes, sometimes they can't because it's too far away, but if that school is within about, you know, 25 or 50 miles, um, you save $10,000 a year by commuting. So uh, if, even if they commute for one or two years, that's a really significant amount of savings. Plan to graduate on time, that will be your biggest money saver right there because they won't have those extra years of tuition and fees. So again, it's a two-year program in and out in school, four-year in and out in school, and make sure that they set themselves up to do that. Textbooks, you can rent textbooks, you can get used textbooks, you can go online for textbooks. Um, I'm a PhD student and my statistics textbook last semester was $300. I found an international publication of it, 20 bucks shipped from India. Um, it had a little, thing, a little sign on it that said don't sell in the United States and they had put a little white sticker over, over that. <laughs> I mean, that was good enough for me. It was the exact same book. So, um, you know, I saved myself $280, but check around. Like, not all of the textbooks are international publications, but um, I found a couple so far. Resident assistantships, um, sometimes they won't let students, freshman students be RAs, but tell them, you know, if you plan on living in the dorm, go, go make friends with the RA and find out how they got that job. Um, so that when they cycle off, maybe your student can set themselves up to get that, they live in the dorm for free, they get the free meal plan, they're an advisor to their peers, and it's cheaper for everyone. So that's an option, ROTC program, um, not all schools participate. If you have a student that's interested, check with the school. Uh, there is scholarship money attached to that. Ask about a cheaper meal plan. They're gonna sign the student up for 19 meals a week. Is your student gonna eat every meal in the cafeteria every single week? Uh, maybe they don't eat breakfast. Boxy granola bars is good enough for them. Um, you can ask the school if they'll reduce it. Some schools will, some schools won't. Some schools think you wait a semester. Again, it's all over the board. Just ask the question. Beware that five or six year plan. The fifth and sixth year are gonna cost you 20 to 25% more because tuition and fees will go up every single year, three, four, five percent. Some of the money runs out. That merit money that schools award to students, you usually have four years of that and that's it. State grant, you qualify for four years and that's it. What if you have to go for the fifth year, you're gonna have to borrow it. Government puts a cap on the student loan borrowing for the direct staffer loans. You can only borrow $31,000 as an undergraduate unless your student, unless your parent gets that plus denial. So most, most students, their parents don't get the plus denial, so they only have $31,000. That means you only have $4,000 left for the fifth year. So now what are you gonna have to do? You're, 
you're going to have to borrow, but you're going to have to make up for all the other money that you lost as well. Things to do right now, so again, if your student's a senior, get your FSA IDs and you can also complete your FAFSA. If your student's a, a junior uh, student, you can't actually complete the FAFSA yet, but there is a FAFSA <coughs> forecaster, so if you go out to FAFSA.gov, um, at the bottom right hand corner, it's spelled exactly like this, FAFSA forecaster, there's a dummy FAFSA application. So you can complete that and it will give you an estimate as to whether you're gonna qualify for a grant or not. Have your students apply for scholarships, visit some of those other websites that I, I talked about earlier, retake SATs or ACTs, um, private institutions that merit money, usually it's awarded to a certain board for a certain GPA, this is how much money you get. Ask to see what the chart looks like if your student's like 50 points away from the next level for the SAT and that next level is $4,000 extra dollars, it might make sense for them to take the SAT one more time to see if you can get bumped up to that next level. This is your timeline. So right now, students should be applying for admission. They should also start to apply for financial aid as well. You have until May 1st to make your decision. So again, hopefully you'll have some of your award letters before the holidays and then you'll get the bulk of the award letters after the holidays and then you'll have you know, three, four, or five months to sit with these and decide how to pay. Um, it used to be you got your award letters in March and April and you really had like 30 to 60 days to figure it all out. Hopefully you'll have a lot more time to do that. You'll pay your deposit by May 1st. Billing will happen in July. For, usually it's due in August. If you're gonna be applying for a PLUS loan, I would apply for that probably sometime in June. Uh, the credit on that is usually good for 120 days, so like if you apply for it now or you apply for it in January, it will expire by the time the school's ready to actually certify it, so you're gonna have to reapply for it. So just apply for it probably in the June, July time frame, and that'll be okay for the school. Um, again, you're filing 17, 18 based on 2015 income information, so if anything changes, you lose a job, divorce separation, you need to make sure you contact the institution that the student will be attending, ask them what their special consideration process is, also contact FIA. Um, there's additional paperwork that you have to complete, but there might be additional financial aid available for the student. Resources for you, the first number is to the federal processor, so if you fill out your FSA IDs or your FAFSA and you have questions, you get locked up in your system. Um, I've had folks that the FSA ID gets revoked and they can't figure out how to change the password or to get it so that it's good. If you call those people, they're very helpful. They have evening hours um, and weekend hours. They should be able to help you with that because they can see exactly what you're looking at. Um, if you do call that number and it's about your student, they won't talk to you unless your student is there. So just keep that in mind um, if you're helping your student through this process. The FIA toll-free number rings to the call center in Harrisburg. So if you have questions about that state grant application or later if FIA asks you for additional information, you're not sure what we we're asking for, those are the people you're gonna to wanna to call for that. This is my email address, so please feel free if you'd like a copy of the slide deck. Um, I can send those slides to you. Um, if you have questions when you leave here, uh, feel free to reach out to me. I stopped giving my phone number out because I'm never in my office, but um, if we need to arrange a time to talk, we can certainly do that through email as well. What kind of questions do you have? really quick um, for the for the FAFSA before we go over to the lab. Is that okay? Do we have some time? Okay. Um, so I want to just go through a couple of things. We'll give folks a moment to clear out if they want. And then if you're sticking around to complete your FAFSA, you want to stay put and we'll uh, resume in one second.
you're completing a 17-18 FAFSA, there is a 16-17 FAFSA application out there. You're not going to complete that one because your student's not currently enrolled. Just keep that in mind. There are student sections to the application and there are parent sections to the application. Um, the one that's, that parents most frequently miss is on the first page of demographics. It's the student section and it says, what is your, what is your current marital status? And if a parent's completing that, they'll say that they're married, but they're really asking the marital status of the student. So make sure that you do answer that they're single because most students aren't married. Social security number, that is the only thing that we can't fix. So make sure that you use the correct social security number for the student. Um, most commonly, transposing numbers happens, or a parent will use another child's social security number for this child. So that's the only thing we can't correct. If you use the wrong social, you have to do a new FAFSA. Everything else we can fix. There's a gender question. Answer the question. Uh, female students are not required to register with Selective Service. Male students are required to register with Selective Service. So if the student is a male student, then they get the Selective Service question. If they're not 18 yet, there's a block that will pop up that will say register me so that when the student does turn 18, it, they will automatically get registered with Selective Service. It's a federal requirement. They have to do it to receive financial aid. Um, income tax information, there is an IRS data retrieval tool on the FAFSA, so we, sh we should be able to link to your 2015 taxes and pull those into the application. You will need your W-2 information um, because that information will not actually feed in, so hopefully you brought your W-2s with you tonight. There is that state grant application, so when you get to the end of your FAFSA, you submit it. Um, we should be able to print, correct? Okay, so you'll print that, that confirmation page off but don't quit, you're not done. You have to link to that state grant form, so keep that in mind, you wanna to link to that, and then complete that application, print the signature page. Uh, FSA IDs, how many of you brought those with you tonight? Some, okay, hopefully most of you did. Um, again, the student needs one and one parent will need one. If you didn't bring your FSA ID with you, you can start the application and there will be places within the application to apply for that. Uh, it might take you a little bit longer tonight to complete it. So um, we'll see how far we can get. And I don't know, if you're, I was at a school the other night that the computers automatically shut off at 8.30, so. We're good. <laughs> okay, we're good. Um, but we still don't want to be here all night, so. Um, when you go to the website, make sure you go to FAFSA.gov, make sure your website looks like this. If you haven't done anything yet, you, you just have your FSA IDs, you're just gonna start a new FAFSA. Um, again, there's a student bar, so everything you answer about this will be for the student. Um, if you have your FSA ID, you're gonna click that little radio button. If you don't, you're gonna click the one on the right and type in their social security number, name, and date of birth. If you have the FSA ID, you're gonna enter it right there. You're gonna click next. Use the next and the prior buttons that are in the application. Do not use those back and forward buttons that are in the browser. It will knock you out of the FAFSA. So keep that in mind. You wanna use the next and the prior buttons. You're gonna make sure it says 17, 18. This is an old screen. Um, it asks you for a save key. Do not overthink this. This is just so you can get back into the application if you get locked out today. So your favorite color, your family dog name, it can be the color blue, it doesn't matter. So I had parents the other night like really thinking hard about this and I reached over and I typed blue because it's like it doesn't matter. You just type something in there and write it down in case you get knocked out of your application. You'll click next, you'll click next. Um, there's a bar across the top it tells you where you are in the application. You have to go forward to go back. So um, you can't jump ahead or anything. You just have to go in the order. But then if you realize, oh, I put the wrong email address or I answered that question on the first page incorrectly, I can go back to that. Um, demographic questions for your student. So you're gonna start with the um, gender question, put the address in, domicile, uh, phone number, email address. Again, it should match the email address that you put on the FSA ID. If it doesn't, it will not let you sign the application. Um, there's, here's the married questions. So you'll put that they're single. Driver's license, if you have it, you can put it. If you don't, it doesn't matter. You don't have to include it. Click next. Um, that you're a US citizen or not. Here's the selective service question. Register me if you're not 18. They're gonna have a high school diploma. They're gonna be either first year attended some college, maybe they did dual enrollment, or it will be never attended college first year. 
and what degree are they working on. It's either a first bachelor's degree or a first associate's degree. Do not put anything else in there. Um, here's the work study question. Will you have your first bachelor's degree? You're going to say no. Are you a foster youth? You'll say yes or no. Um, and then they, they don't ask for mom or dad anymore. They ask for parent one and parent two. So just be consistent. If mom's parent one and dad's parent two, then you just use that specification the whole way through the application. Just don't go back and forth. Just keep it the same. You click next. This is where you'll put in Baldwin High School. Uh, you click confirm. It'll pop up at the bottom. You'll click on it and hit next. And then this is where you add the post-secondary school. If you know the six-digit code for the school, you can type it over here and click search. If you don't know the six-digit code, you can look it up, click search. A block pops up with your options. You'll click the little radio button, click add. You'll accumulate your list of schools. Again, up to 10 schools. And then once you have your schools, you'll click next. You'll select the housing. Now the order of the schools doesn't matter except the school that's listed first will get the state grant record. If a student ends up not going to that school choice, you just have to remember to change it with FIA. So that's just a little caveat that, you know, when you get your award letters and when you get your bills, and you think you were supposed to get a state grant and there's no state grant on there, you may have forgotten to change the school on this. So just keep that in mind. I know students aren't really sure where they're attending yet. These are the dependency questions. Most 18-year-old students are going to answer no to all of these. Students who are in legal guardianship, there is a legal guardianship question that they'll answer yes, which will make them independent. If the student's dependent, they're gonna get this screen. Um, I will provide parental information on unable. You would, you, you would say I am providing parental information. The only way you would say that you're not able to is in cases of abuse or neglect, abandonment. That would be the only reason you wouldn't say that. Parents, it changes to parent demographic information. Um, that the little bar changes. This is where you're going to do the um, IRS data retrieval process. You're going to say you've already completed your 15 taxes, um, and then we'll be able to link you. Um, which parent has the FSA ID? You have to select that. You'll enter the FSA ID, and you'll click link to the IRS. It'll take you out there, and then it'll pull your data into your FAFSA application, and I can help you with that. You're going to click OK twice. You have to type in your address information. The address has to match what you put on your taxes. So if you spelled out street, you have to spell out street. Um, if you have an old address on last year's taxes, you have to use that old address for, for that to work. Once you have the information pulled in, it will tell you which items were transferred. Um, here's where you have to use your W-2. So you have to delineate what the wages are, so whatever, for parent one, whatever their wages were, and then the other one is gonna fill in automatically. Um, are you a dislocated worker, unemployed, or laid off? Would be why you would complete that. Um, un all of this should transfer over um, untaxed income. This one here, payments to tax deferred pension and retirement savings plans, that's if you contribute to a 401k. On, in box 12 with your W-2, there would be a number with a letter. If you open up that box, it tells you which letters you have to include there. Uh, it does ask you an asset question. So as of today, does the total amount of your parents' current assets exceed, and it's gonna give you a number, you're gonna say yes or no. Again, you don't include your house, your retirement, or your life insurance. You're going to click next, which is back to the student. The student goes through the IRS data retrieval process. If they worked in 15, if they didn't work in 2015, you're going to say they didn't file. The next page will ask for wages for the student. Um, you'll put zero if they didn't work. And then they do have to answer the asset questions. The first one, what's the current value of your cash savings checking? You're going to put whatever they have in there today. Um, the second one is investments. Um, UGMA, UGMA accounts, sometimes students might have that or they might have a trust fund. That would be what you list there. If it's zero, you put zero. And the last one is a farm question, and I've been in this business for 20 years and I've never encountered a student with a farm, so you put zero. Um, the last page, are you a preparer? You're gonna just leave it as no. That's if you paid somebody to complete your FAFSA. Hopefully, if the user ID and password are already in here, you just have to agree to the statement and click sign. Again, parent, you can select which parent it is, agree to the statement and click sign, and then you'll submit. You're gonna get this confirmation play page. You're gonna click on print this page. Make sure you go chase it because we're gonna be in a lab. Um, so for you know, security, privacy reasons, just go get your paper, bring it back to your seat, and then click on start your state application. It will take you out to FIA. You're gonna click continue. 
There's about seven or eight additional questions. You submit it online, and then you're gonna get a screen. It's gonna look a little bit different than this. This will be like over here, and it just says view and print your, your state grant form. You click on it, it opens up a PDF. You'll print the PDF, print two copies, one for your record and one to send to FIA. I think that's all I have for you. Um, any questions before we 